Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Iowa Pagan News on the Prairie Land Radio Network. <laughs> I want to give a thank to uh, my good friend, Bran, who has uh, so generously offered to uh, do some intro spots for us here at Iowa Pagan News. And this morning, um, we're going to be joined by our very special guest, Liz Williams. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about her and also uh, give you a little bit of uh, information about uh, our sponsor for this week, uh, an unpaid sponsor at that. Uh, this week, I had a really good experience with Firehouse Subs. And I want to tell you something about them that sets them apart from all the rest of the uh, sub chains. Uh, a portion of each sale goes directly to local firefighters and EMS departments, uh, statewide and then also nationally. This is something I've been supporting for a very long time, and it's something that I would love to have everyone get behind. So be sure to pick up the sub from Firehouse. Uh, for those of you who are locally to Iowa, uh, it, I know you're not going to regret it whatsoever. <laughs> Let's get back to it. Our guest today is Liz Williams, a renowned sci-fi writer, occultist, and historian. She's been publishing books since 2001 and has about 20 novels to her name, not to mention her short story collections. She's also recently released a nonfiction title called Miracles of Our Own Making. I got to say, I've been excited about this one uh, ever since I made contact with Liz about her uh, paperback book that just uh, has recently been released. And here at IOPN, we try to be as inclusive as we can to all pagans, regardless of race, creed, or sexuality. And this book is jam-packed with information for those of you who want to learn. I think it'd be a great resource for all of our brothers and sisters who are new to the path. So, Liz, let's get started here. Why don't you tell us about yourself? Well, I'm um, sitting here in a sunny conservatory in Somerset in England. I'm not very far <laughs> away from Glastonbury, which is uh, often called Pagan Central. And um, it's a little town with um, a long history, both in the music industry, because it's where we hold the big festival known as Glastonbury. Um, but it's also become over the last, um, really on and off over the last hundred years, a center for um, spiritual seekers of the esoteric and people who are curious about different religions. And that includes very much um, the pagan path these days. It's very much mm -hmm. kind of, um, a little bit of a mecca for pagans basically. and. Until last year, I and my partner Trevor ran a witchcraft shop for about 15 years um, in the centre of Glastonbury itself, known as the Cat and Cauldron. We closed down because our lease came to an end, um, nothing to do with COVID, but we were kind mm. of happy to be out of it during the whole lockdown period. We, we ended just when COVID started. So that was what we've been doing for a long time commercially. Um, I'm also a writer, as you say, I, I write... Um, novels, short stories, mainly in the genres of science fiction and fantasy. But recently I've started branching out and had the opportunity to branch out into non-fiction. So I've done a book um, which um, Earl alluded to called Miracles of Our Own Making, which is about the history of um, the, British, the British witchcraft scene, the occult. And also um, for Llewellyn Press in the States, I have a book on hand fasting. It's coming up out a little bit later on this year. So that's where I am today. Very nice. Now, do you have any plans of getting back into the store at all? Uh, no, we don't at the moment. The building wasn't our building and it was sold. Um, and I'd like to um, support some of our friends in the witchcraft owning business community. There are some people doing some really great stuff across the country mm -hmm. um, and we're still supplying them. We make incense. Um, my partner makes scrying mirrors and wands and so on. So we're actually into supplying some of our friends and uh, colleagues rather than going back into the bricks and mortar business ourselves. But we do have an online shop and we're carrying on with, uh, with that and have been all throughout uh, the pandemic. Well, I'm glad that you're able to still continue to uh, make your items from home and still supply uh, our fellow stores. I mean, that's, that's also huge to the pagan community. 
Yeah, we've been very lucky. And, um, you know, it's been tough for a lot of people. And Glastonbury, um, you know, a lot of the people who run shops there, we, we know them, we're personally friendly with them. There's been a very good atmosphere in the last few years among the pagan community um, in terms of, uh, you know, the people haven't gone down the witch war or the rivalry route. They've been very supportive of each other. And that's always great to see that kind of collegiate atmosphere. And that's something that we're very keen to, um, to carry on supporting, um, you know, especially in a time of national crisis. Of course, uh, understandable completely. And now, uh, in reading through miracles, I noticed that you went straight to the historical records, even mm -hmm. quoting some passages. Now, how long did it take you to find your source material for this project? Well, it's something that um, I've been interested in for a long time. So some of it I knew where to go immediately and who to go to. Um, so with regard to Druidry, for example, you're looking at some of the Roman writers because as we explore in the book, um, the Celts themselves didn't write anything down. So with these very ancient um, peoples, you've got kind of limited source material. Um, and But you also have to look into the reliability of that. You know, did they really know? Were they guessing? Um, were they, uh, was it a propaganda exercise? Because this is a colonial people, the Romans, writing about a country that they have essentially colonized. Uh, so some of the, um, the actual sort of re reliability uh, of that remains to be interpreted and, and seen. Um, some of it, though, I mean, I, I must say, when I was writing the book, I did become aware that there were great big gaps in what I know, knew and also what I thought I knew. So doing some of the reading, I found that um, those gaps were filled, but also um, my own um, understanding was revised. And I think you have to kind of just keep on doing that. You know, we're constantly finding out more about the past and about mm -hmm. the way that people thought. And I, I don't think you can become too fixed on one set of opinions. You've really got to kind of be open to changing your mind when you find um, something that, that, you know, you thought was true, but wasn't particularly true. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, and that's true. Now, have you and Tamara had a chance to collaborate at all? I don't, th I don't think we have. Does she run a podcast? Uh, basically, she's got. Uh, she's one who released her uh, uh, Pagan Elders book. She's out of Australia. Ah, right. Oh, right. Okay. No, I haven't connected with her in that case, but I shall certainly look out for it. And uh, you know, that's something that we're we're always very keen to um, uh, to do because we can promote other people's books uh, through the platform of the online shop as well as our own social media. So yeah, I shall. Thank you very much for raising that as a heads up, and I shall go and look. <laughs> as I say, it seems how well and now, Grant. I know that you two have some distance between you as well, between you being Glastonbury and yeah. she being down in Australia. So, but uh, uh, it's always good for uh, fellow authors in the UK Absolutely. to help support each other too. Absolutely, yeah, and um, you know, social media being what it is these days. Um, you know, we've just had a virtual science fiction convention in Britain, EasterCon, and mm. I got to talk um, because we used it on the, it was done on a platform called GatherTown, which is proximity based social media is probably where. So you get a little avatar and you get to walk around and you can actually talk to people because the screen, like the screens that we're speaking on now, pop up if you walk your avatar past another person. And so I was able to speak to some of the Australian authors um, whom I've been corresponding with for years. Um, but, um, you know, we've not actually sort of spoken in the flesh, as it were, and we still haven't, but we've spoken virtually, you know, so the world is becoming a much smaller place and uh, the pagan world itself is not huge. So I think it's it's great for us to have the opportunity to to kind of find out what other people are doing and, and push that a bit. You know, it's all a it's all a community, as you say, it's a community exercise. Oh, yes, very much so. Okay, now for those of you who are tuning in via Facebook, you can click on the live video and you can join us here in StreamYard uh, so that you can uh, participate in chat uh, with us so that you can post questions for Liz. And I've also posted the link for StreamYard. So if you would like to participate live with us, and ask a question for Liz, you can do that too. So I encourage everybody to do that with us this morning. Please do. Okay, now, uh, with your book, do you think it's something that someone just starting out on their path would be able to access easily? Yes, I think so. And it was designed to be that sort of book. 
um, you know, it's an introduction to uh, an overview of the field. And I, I think I and the editor realized when we started off that we had been just a little bit ambitious in trying to cover the whole of British history. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it's like we did not start small. And uh, there's a lot that I did miss out. Um, I would have liked to have gone into witchcraft in Scotland in far more detail, for example. And we haven't really touched on Ireland, which is a huge other subject um, at all in this book. Um, but as a general overview, um, I've had some very good results, um, the responses from um, students who are uh, looking at the history of the esoteric and the history of witchcraft, the history of druidry, who are actually at universities um, across the country. And they've been writing in, uh, you know, not huge numbers of people, but enough to kind of make me feel um, that the book has been helpful. Several people have said this is the book I've been waiting for because it kind of pulls everything together and it gives them an overview of, um, mm -hmm. of the history in chronological linear order. We didn't try and do anything really clever about this. And there's quite a lot of the book that, um, you know, if, if we don't know, we can't speculate. So we have to right. just say, okay, here's what we know. Here's what we think we know and take it from there. So that's the, sort of some of the wilder claims that you get um, in pagan literature. Those are not really present in the book. I've tried to keep it as factual as possible. Sure, I haven't succeeded and I'm sure I've missed some things out, but hopefully, yeah, it will, will be a good overview for somebody who is new to the craft, new to Druidry, um, new to the um, the, the witching uh, theme as it were. Mm -hmm. Now I know that when it comes to uh, pagan pride festivals that uh, is it England who has one of the largest ones in the UK right now? Yeah, we have a number of pagan festivals, or we had before COVID. Uh, we yeah. had witch fests regularly. Witch fests were um, one of the big pagan meetups. We have started to have more pagan pride um, because I think people are looking at gay pride. There's a big demographic um, between the two, and mm -hmm. people are learning from each other. So, um, so yeah, there are. There's a big pagan pride in the Midlands. I know um, that hopefully will be happening either later this year or, or postponed till next year. Um, but yes, these these events are becoming more noticeable. They're becoming um, more common, and um, and it's great. It's it's really good for people to be able to go along and talk to people who are involved and listen to talks. And it's a lot more open than obviously it was in the seventies or the or even the eighties. Right, and along the fact that. Um... It seems to me that uh, a lot of, uh, what was it, uh, is it, is it Iceland who just recently went back to the old ways of paganism yeah, for their religion? Did. Yeah, they did. They've. Um, I don't know whether it's the official religion. It might be, actually. Um, but I certainly know that they seem to be revising some of the, the temple complexes um, that they had. And it's um, it's it's a popular... A popular thing up there. I've not been to Iceland. I would love to go. It's a fascinating culture. But yes, you're right. They they seem to be, you know, taking it very seriously. As I say, from what I read, yeah, they're they were taking this quite literally and very seriously. That uh, mm -hmm. they were switching back, which I was, yeah. I was very happy to see that. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of people were very pleased that uh, they were actually wanting to go back to the old ways and it's like that's yeah. that's something that i myself have taken upon my path uh because right. that's it's basically what i call a uh eclectic path of antiquity which means okay. i do value the old ways yes yeah i think that's a great thing to do and um i know that uh I think with the Icelandic culture, it's the the old those old ways are a lot better documented than they are here. Um, you know, we had a lot of um, the Celts, as I say, didn't write anything down. We were reliant on Roman writings. Um, Saxons and the Vikings, yeah, a little bit more. We do know a little bit more about what they actually did. But mm -hmm. I think in general, the nature-based pagan paths are becoming more popular, and I think that's partly because people have felt over the last few decades, and you know, much longer than that, probably that they have become somewhat divorced from the natural world. And um, and they also feel that they need to be grounded, you know, which mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, you um, know, contemporary paths such as the New Age, they may be great, but they don't necessarily give you that sense of ancestry um, and belonging to a place. And by belonging, I mean people of all 
um, ethnicities and all different parts. You know, they can all have that sense mm -hmm. um, when if they, you know, whether they're born in Britain or not. So I think inclusivity is something that I'm very concerned about and very in favor of. Mm -hmm. And what has been the, from when you're doing the research for your book, uh, what have you found to be the general consensus of the acceptability of uh, pagans and uh, paganism and witchcraft? Uh, well, these days, it's, um, I wouldn't say it was mainstream, but it's certainly, I mean, I've had very few um, negative experiences with other people. And um, when we, you know, we used to go to trade fairs as, uh, as a witchcraft shop, and we'd say, people would say, oh, you're, you know, is that just the name of the shop? Or are you actually Wiccan? And they generally said Wiccan, actually, they're fairly well informed. Um, and their, their responses were always very sort of positive, uh, very kind of interested. People sometimes crack jokes, but that's fine. You know, it's, um, we're not humorless about it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think these days in the UK, it is becoming a lot more accepted. And also a lot of people, you know, even if they wouldn't ever consider themselves a magical practitioner, they've had experience of something like Reiki, crystal healing, um, you know, the, the sort of more, perhaps more new age healing practices have become something that they're a little bit familiar with. So they know, feel like they know a little bit about it. They may not. But that's fine. The, the level of sort of um, fear and religious repression um, isn't really a thing here, or at least it's, mm -hmm. it's small. Um, we've had, um, we have very good relationships with the church in Glastonbury, uh, with the Christian church. The vicar comes to dinner regularly. We go to dinner with her. Um, you know, they're good people. I've gone to do talks at the cathedral in Wells. Um, and they've been, they've been the ones reaching out to us, actually. Um, so this is, this is all positive stuff, you know, it's, it's very um, encouraging to see. Um, and that, this is not to paint some kind of super rosy picture in which everybody loves each other and gets along. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure that there are going to be people uh, who oh, yeah. do react badly to it, <laughs> and do react negatively. Um, but there's also got to be the other, we've got to pay attention to the other side of it, which is people, um, you know, being supportive, being intrigued, being interested. Um, you know, and wanting to know more about it. Right. Which I think is definitely the case. So that's the case now. You know, um, if you were talking about the 1960s, the 1930s, the 1600s, you know, it's <laughs> a different story. Right. Exactly. Now, when I was living up north in Minnesota, uh, there is a small group of pagans who would uh, collaborate with the local nuns uh okay. doing serving um uh let's see i think it was a community breakfast that they would do uh on a regular basis and they were i mean it was a big write-up in the paper right. that uh, the local pagans and nuns working together uh for this uh community breakfast which uh I, I i tell you i will admit i got a little bit of a laugh out of but yeah, I, absolutely. I took it as a positive thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it just surprised right. me that yeah, that it, hat was taking place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, but it's, um, it, it just shows, you know, there's a lot of this stuff going on, actually. And we tend not to hear too much about it. We tend to hear about the, um, you know, the, the awful kind of, um, you know, battles between the two religions and people's terrible experiences. And those are definitely the case, you know, those definitely do occur. Um, but at the same time, you don't hear about the community breakfast. This is the first time I've heard of that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you don't hear about um, pagans and Christians having conferences together, which is something that's happened over here. You know, the interfaith scene is, is increasingly um, a thing. And mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, that's a good thing. But we do have a slightly different version of Christianity um, in the UK to, to say what I understand parts of the Midwest to have you know it's um, it's pretty mild and tolerant over here really yeah uh, like you said i think that's been the only case i've ever seen and uh that granted this was back several years ago but uh uh i still took it as a really good positive thing it was just because i will admit that there was a time where i was working at mercy hospital in des moines which at that time was run by the nuns and i got along fine with the uh nuns back then uh 
and especially the uh well basically sister pat who was the head nun who was running the entire thing and it's like anytime you'd see her come walking down the hall everybody would split it was right. like general like general red yeah. yeah general patton coming through i'm like oh brother <laughs> oh wow uh, well, nuns can be formidable people, formidable women. Yeah, I will admit that. Oh, let's see. You know, uh, now, you covered a lot of different traditions in the book, but I'm curious, which tradition do you relate to the most? Uh, well, I kind of refer to myself these days as a, as a practicing British occultist um, because I'm interested in the British traditions. Um, mm -hmm. I'm an occultist, and, um, and I practice, so duh. Uh, but when I started out, um, and I'm still in Obod, which is, the order, as you know, the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids, um, it was Druidry that uh, attracted me, basically because my background is Welsh and Scottish, um, although the increasing numbers of English um, relatives seem to be coming out of the woodwork at the moment. I've been doing some genealogical research. Um, and I'm not totally tied into, um, you know, it's, it's, it's my ethnicity, so that's why I'm interested in it. It was more that I was brought up with it. And my dad was Welsh, so we used to go to Wales a lot. And I was brought up with all the Welsh myths and legends. And that makes Druidry really a natural fit. Um, so mm -hmm. I joined the Order of Bards, o Ovates and Druids in about, trying to think, about 1997, I think. Um, and have remained in it ever since. I go to regular meetings um, uh, when we're allowed to. And um, sometimes rituals. I don't tend to go to camps, but they do have camps. Um, so I still retain a great affection for Druidry. And again, it's it's very it's a very British form of druidry. It's terribly mild. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are radicals associated with the movement. There are some people who do do a lot of political activism for things like anti-fracking, uh, for extinction rebellion. It's mainly the kind of environmental side of things. Um, mm -hmm. But you don't have to do that. Um, you know, it's it's a it really is kind of a, a church of many houses to to borrow a metaphor from our our Christian friends. Um, there are Christians in the order. There are Buddhists in the order. You know, it's, it's super inclusive, mm -hmm. really. Uh, bends sure. over backwards to do that. And that's that's always good. Well, now, do you feel that, that has impacted some of the stories that you have written? Um, a little bit, yeah. I'm quite interested in environmental issues. So my first novel, Ghost Sister, was about, um, about that. But a lot of um, what I'm doing now, which is a, a series um, called Ember Tide, the first novel, Comet Weather, is out, so is Blackthorn Winter. And it's a set of four novels set over the course of um, the seasons of the year. I've just written the one set in spring, and I'm kind of tweaking that before I came to talk to you this afternoon. <laughs> um, but that's about magic. Uh, that's very much about folklore. It's set in southern England, so counties like um, Somerset, where I'm sitting now, Dorset, mm -hmm. Hampshire, Cornwall, London. Uh, because I felt that the Cornish, uh, sorry, the Welsh and Scottish mythologies, um, an awful lot of fantasy writers have done a lot with those. You know, they're very much sort of go-to ground, and they are really interesting cultures. But England tends to get slightly ignored, but some of the folklore is really interesting. Some of the old magical practices and, um, you know, the, the attitude towards witchcraft is, is really interesting. I didn't feel that that had been explored quite as much as it should have been, um, or, as, mm -hmm. you know, a lot there so i'm using that at the moment so that's very definitely having an effect on um on what i'm doing and you know there are a lot of obviously monuments down here there's the stonehenge for a start that's been hugely mm -hmm. in the press at the moment because of this proposed road movement mm -hmm. yeah a avebury is is also down here lots and lots of local stone circles standing stones um, the big white horses, the ch chalk figures carved onto the hilltops. You know, there's a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm kind of looking backwards to the folklore right now for what I'm doing in terms of my fiction. As I say, uh, now, as I say, with Stonehenge, have they, I mean, do they take into consideration that they, a lot of people consider that to be sacred ground? Yeah, they do. Um, I mean, it's 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 a hugely contentious issue, and I've got a, I've been writing it up for the Wild Hunt, and um, I do have a lot of sympathy with kind of pretty much everybody really, uh, mm -hmm. because at the moment it it is a sacred site, um, but if you stand um, on stone uh, at Stonehenge and look south, uh, you can see an expressway, um, CA three hundred three. This huge main road. It's belting mm -hmm. straight through the landscape. 
Um, there's kind of, you know, there's all sorts of issues about where they should have put that road. Um, but the fact is, we've got it now. It gets very congested. It's not mm -hmm. great to look on the uh, look out from the monument. Um, so when this whole road tunnel thing actually goes through, they're basically they're taking taking the road along, and then it's going to go under, um, not Stonehenge itself. It's going to go under, um, you know, a couple of miles, mile or so south of the site, um, okay. and take the road away from the site. So I think if you ask somebody this question in about 30 years' time, if the road does go ahead, was it a good thing? They'll probably say yes, because it's actually restoring the landscape to um, the way that it would have looked a little bit more in ancient times. You know, not totally, because we don't know what the trees were right. like, all the rest of it. But you won't have essentially a, a small motorway belting through it. And I think that's what they're doing. But, of course, the, the people who are concerned about it are saying that it's been rushed through um, it uh, the transport secretary doesn't really seem to have taken a lot into consideration and I think they've got a high court hearing in the summer to, uh, to actually assess that um, right. and the people who are protesting are saying what about the archaeology you know there's other stuff across the whole of Salisbury Plain it's a huge site there is um, material from times past even though they're doing a rescue dig now, that's going to be um, obliterated. Mm -hmm. So they're obviously very concerned about that. So it's kind of a, you know, I, I can see both sides, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a lot of sympathy for the people who are protesting about it. I do also have some sympathy for the people who are saying, no, we really, we have to do something about the road. Right. Now, and I know this, that's been a huge subject here lately. And mm -hmm. I really hope that, uh, everyone can come to a mutual conclusion and to be able to have a good positive resolve for it because um, uh, I really hope that the government will actually yeah. take into consideration what it's going to take to put it in and what it the effects it's going to have during that time uh, yeah I know it's going to be super disruptive when they're actually constructing it um, and I think one of the things that people are saying is, why don't they, uh, if, if they made it a longer tunnel so that the end of it came out, you know, a couple of miles further along, then mm. they'd, they'd avoid a lot of the problems um, that they're, they're currently facing. But it's money. Right. And there's, also, there's also a couple of issues about um, the actual structure of the tunnel. that you need, if, if cars get stuck in it, you need fans. Uh, you know, to, so that people aren't being sort of poisoned where they sit and all the rest of it. So, but I don't know too much about that side of things. But there are uh, there are arguments for a longer tunnel, and I think some of the people protesting at the moment would be happy if that was to happen. Um, but you know, this government is um, a little bit prone to rushing projects through. It's prone to giving projects to um, maybe people who aren't the best people to do something. Mm -hmm. And that's got to be a financial motive. So lots of questions about that, really. Yeah, I can understand that completely. Okay, we're going to take a quick station break and hear from a couple of our uh, local stores that uh, we've done some uh, audio spots for. And once we get those done, we'll be right back with more from Liz Williams. So don't go nowhere. I'll be right back with you here in just to bring about two and two.
All right, we are back with Liz Williams, and we've got a little bit more that uh, we're going to be discussing about. And you just got done listening to uh, Be You Apothecary out of uh, Apopka, Illinois, and then also uh, Sister Moon down in Florida. And I have regular communication with Sister the ladies of Sister Moon. Um, you can also uh, take part in their regular Tarot Tuesday video session that they do every Tuesday morning about, uh, well, for me, it's usually been between 10 and 11 o'clock uh, Central Time. So be sure to stop in and uh, join them on their video chat. All right, now then, Liz. Uh, let's see. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how these traditions have evolved as they've traveled overseas and across the continents. Wow, that's a big question. And uh, <laughs> it's a fascinating question that I think, um, you know, is, is an ongoing historical research project, basically. And, uh, you know, we're, we're finding out more and more about um, what people took with them um, when they went. And one of the things that's interested mm -hmm. me at the moment is um, just how much of the, the old Golden Dawn, the late 19th century great occult society, actually went out to New Zealand. Um, it, quite a quite a lot of it um, seems to have travelled over to the Antipodes, and um, you know a temple was set up in New Zealand. There are still some quite elderly people who remember, um, of, you know, original members of the the sort of post Golden Dawn period who went out there, and that sort of thing is just fascinating. And I think there's a lot of that that's um, going to not come out of the woodwork so much, but maybe be rediscovered. Um, you know, people who went over to this out to the states. And, and Canada, you know, who were taking bits of their traditions with them. Um, I suspect there is paperwork in people's attics that uh, is yet to uh, be discovered <laughs> and turn up, um, you know, to the edification of us all. And of course, those traditions are going to ch uh, change. You know, a lot of them are not very old traditions to start with. You know, Wicca is um, not as old as a lot of people would like to claim, but right. it's kind, of, it's kind of so what, you know, it's still valid, it's still viable. Um, but these are developing transformative paths. And I personally think that's a really good thing. I'm not very in favor of dogma. And um, I'm, I very much feel that we are not really peoples of the books, you know, mm -hmm. so whereas, um, you know, the big Middle Eastern religions do rely on sacred texts, although that we have texts that we may greatly respect and admire, um, we're not tied to them. So there isn't anything to stop people changing. And I mean, okay, I know, pagans, you're herding <laughs> cats. Uh, they're going to be, uh, people are going to have uh, people's front of Judea and Judea people's national front kind of <laughs> arguments about uh, the right way to do things. That's sort of natural and inevitable. Uh, but at the same time, there is a great deal of tolerance within the pagan communities. And mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I think this is a really valuable thing. And maybe we need to big that up a little bit for ourselves. Um, so, you know, I know people who have um, who are, have taken things out to the states who are developing uh, Thelema, who are developing Wicca, who are developing Druidry, heathenism in all sorts of new and exciting ways. Um, so I think um, it's very much an ongoing historical project. And I expect to see many PhDs and, and many PhD theses uh, coming out of the, the history of, um, of witchcraft and, and Druidry and um, other occult traditions because that's what we're doing now you know we are the ancestors really that's you know given it mm. given another 300 years and people are going to be looking back at us and saying well what did they do and they're going to be bickering for sure about what we did and whether we did it in the right way but we are all part of an ongoing historical process mm -hmm. and one thing that um in my research of uh, paganism, when I first got started in this, um, that was back in 2003. Um, one term that uh, I came across is pagans are also known as people of the prairie. Right. And um, the one thing that uh, I think, I don't know what it is, but um, my own personal belief is that because 
I also follow a Native American spirituality path. Right. And to me, the Native American spirituality, along with my pagan path, go hand in hand. And right. I think it also goes to what I also have talked about numerous times about uh, getting back to how things were back in the old days of living off the land uh, when you're when right. our ancestors were living on the prairies and right. getting back to doing what our ancestors were doing back then because uh, that's something that's kind of been lost right yes and i mean i uh, you know from a british perspective what always um i kind of came across to me and and that's reading stuff like um laura ingalls wilder little house on the prairie and so on you know those <laughs> books are not unproblematic from a modern perspective um, mm -hmm. But what came across to me was just how incredibly tough those people were. You know, just mm -hmm. unbelievably tough. And what they endured, whatever you think about, um, you know, colonial um, expansion and the rest of it, the, the, the way that they had to deal with their environment um, was just stunning, really. You know, it's, it, you have to have huge respect uh, for that side of it, I think. And... Um, you know, it's a long time in Britain since we had to deal with those kinds of conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, history's not been a great place to live in. It's uh, full of disease and uh, and war. But, um, you know, the English climate is such that it's not terribly extreme. It's gone, you know, from, it's, it's been more extreme in the past. Um, but at mm -hmm. the moment, you know, it's not really that extreme. And when I think of these incredibly cold conditions that people had to live on them, incredible heat you know and and just things like plagues of locusts and so on um, mm -hmm. how many of those you get these days but uh, certainly it used to be a thing and i just think yeah wow you know mm -hmm. and do you think it's something that uh, we should continue to try to teach especially for uh, our new people who are coming in to uh following trying to just find their path and uh doing their own research on what paganism is and Jerudry, heathen, uh, Wicca, you name it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always a good thing to have um, a basis in the natural world um, because otherwise you can get very, um, you can kind of lose sight of the fact that you're a human being living on a planet. Mm -hmm. And obviously sure. we've seen that with the, with the whole climate change thing. Whatever you think about that, climates change. You know, they do it for a pastime. And if you are sort of divorced from that process, I think it's very easy to to kind of lose your way as a person. You know, the Japanese have this concept of forest bathing, that you go out into nature to deal with depression. And mm -hmm. it's not that easy. I mean, I, I'm in favor of if you have um, a mental health crisis, look at all the options, you know, do not rule out the pharmaceutical do not rule out um, talking cures, but also don't rule out um, going out into nature because it can very much tie you into um, a connection with the land that you're living on. And I think having that connection, personally, that's something I feel very valuable, is very valuable uh, because mm -hmm. I live, um, I'm, I'm actually looking out on an orchard right now. Um, we're very lucky, you know, we live in a great place. Um, but that orchard has to be looked after, it has to be maintained. There's all sorts of animal and bird life in it. Um, that we need to, we, we are kind of stewards and guardians um, rather than owners mm -hmm. of that land. Um, so I do think it's something that we need to teach people. Um, and kids are getting a sort of increasingly um, moved away from that and into the electronic world. And I think that children yeah. are naturally very curious. And if you take them out and, you know, you show them chickens and where eggs come from and you show them how to grow things, they're totally into it, a lot of them. You know, they're very, very keen to learn. Um, so mm -hmm. it's definitely something that I would say, yeah, you know, you don't have to go totally back to the land, um, you know, and sort of build your own log cabin or stuff like that. Great if you do, um, but you don't have to do that. But at least be aware of what's around you. Mm -hmm. Yep, I would agree. Uh, who knows? There may come a time where we may have to, but... Yeah. Hopefully that hopefully that won't have occur. But I mean, it's good to have that knowledge. It is good to have that knowledge, and I think that knowledge is valuable in itself, and I don't think it should be lost. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Um, it, it's it's good for people to know how to do physical things. True. Now, do you think that some of the tenants have been skewed in any way, or do you believe that for the most part, people are sticking to the traditions closely? Um, I think they they do, but traditions are always going to be um, you know something that evolves and grows. Um, I'm not very keen on nationalism. I have to say that's a personal. Um, political thing. I, I believe in respecting where you come from um, and taking an objective look at your ancestors. I mean, some of my ancestors uh, were great people. Some of them were terrible people, you know, but uh, they're not, um, this is not something I, I necessarily um, want to either applaud or hide. It's something that I think you've got to look, go back and look uh, as objectively yeah. as possible about your culture and where you come from. Um, so I, I'm sort of in favor of um, looking at the pathways of the land that you yourself come from um, if mm -hmm. you feel called to those pathways if you don't if you feel called to something else um, then I think if we if we do believe that there is something beyond if we do believe that there are gods and goddesses and spirits of all sorts then it may very well be that something is speaking to you um, from mm -hmm. another culture um, and it's kind of not ours to reason why people feel a very strong call towards certain things and um, you know, it's not necessarily for me to criticize that. Mm -hmm. It's for them to look at. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the, the skewing, if there is any, it tends to be a little bit political. Um, yeah. I don't think pagans are the worst at doing that. Um, you know, I see, um, I, I, I occasionally on Facebook, I see a meme of Jesus with an AK-47. <laughs> and I kind yeah. of think... Yeah, I don't. I think that's skewing it. To be honest, I, I'm, I'm, I, that gives me um, that gives me the creeps. Um, so, I, but I think in general the pagan paths do tend to, you know, they tend to follow certain values, and that a lot of those values are community minded, are nature based, and mm -hmm. so forth. Yeah, I will admit that uh, some of the memes that I see popping up here lately just. <laughs> oh, yeah. I would love to be able to reach through the screen and strangle whoever created them because they're yeah. to me they just create more division, more hate, uh, yeah. more intolerance, and it's like no, that's got to stop. Yeah, it's got to stop. We've got to learn how to be a little bit more tolerant, and I think social media does have a lot to answer for in that it's mm. inherently divisive. You know, there is a lot of division, um, and some of that's possibly formulated from elsewhere, you know, um, who knows, but some of it is definitely internal to the person. And I'm not, I'm to blame as well. You know, you see something and you think, God, that's wrong. Someone is wrong on the internet, <laughs> you know, and you leap in. And then it's taken me a long time to train myself out of that reflex. You don't have to go on the defensive all the time, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be a little bit more tolerant of, of others, I think, but, but they also need to be a little bit more tolerant of us. So, yeah yeah that is true i do agree with you completely though on that um okay now uh would you want to tell people how they can go about finding your books and how they can uh, get in touch with you and so forth totally yeah um the best place to find my books is on amazon or on um for miracles of our own making it's reaction press and for the Comet Weather and Blackthorn Winter, for the novels at the moment, um, it is Newcon Press, but I'm also published in the States by Open Road Media, and they're based in New York City. So there are quite a few places, cool. but um, your go-to, I'm afraid, is, is Amazon, or if you, if you can, your local bookstore. Uh, always support your local bookstore. I've run a bookstore, so I know what it's like, <laughs> but you know, sometimes it's not so easy, and it's not always possible for them to get material, especially if that material is coming from abroad. That's well, true. And That's I'm on social true. media on Facebook. You can come and find me, Liz Williams too. I think I am, um, mm -hmm. but certainly type in Liz Williams on Facebook. Come aboard. We're really happy to see you there. <laughs> and we're on Instagram. Cat and Cauldron is on Instagram. You get a few pictures of witchy stuff and quite a lot of pictures of bits of the Somerset countryside. So nice. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> always that always goes down well. You would not believe the amount of invites that I've had over the years to uh, go over to the UK and visit with uh, a lot of the people who I have come across over the years, made friends yeah. with, and 
develop connections with. And it's like one of these days, yes, I am going to make Absolutely. that trip. Well, come to Glastonbury and um, come and see us. Uh, we would be very happy to see you. That's part, that's part of my plans because uh, I have a whole list <laughs> of uh, places yeah. that uh, I've told that I need to be visiting because it's like, okay. okay. All right. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but those of you who are looking to learn about your books, uh, they can find them on sites like, uh, I, again, Amazon and Goodreads as well, too, they correct? Can. Yes, they can. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I should and, be fairly findable, I think. Okay, and they're available in both um, paper copies and ebooks. Uh, yes, they are, and um, Miracles of Our Own Making has just come out in paperback as well. Uh, but yes, you should be able to get it on Kindle um, or on e your e-reader. Very cool. Well, I definitely want to thank you for taking time out to join me today. Okay. This has been a pleasure getting to sit down and talk with you and get to know you a little bit more. And okay. uh, definitely going to be uh, keep in touch with you because uh, how many now? How many more projects uh, are you working on currently? Uh, well, I'm at the moment. I've I've just finished a novel. I've got another novel in the series to write, and I am sort of exploring with my publisher what we do next this is these are the guys reaction press who have published um miracles of our own making they want me to do something else it's gone down very well it's selling quite well given that we've had a pandemic the reviews have been great um so they've asked me to do something else and we're at the moment we're looking as to what that might be it might be something on folklore hmm. which very i'm cool. very keen on so uh, so yeah that's yeah. We'll definitely be looking forward to uh, getting to know more about that one too. Once you get it done, yeah, I'll, uh, let's watch this space. We may not be able to uh, to do that, but we'll have a go. You know, we'll see how we get on. Very cool. All right, everyone, we have been uh, talking with Liz Williams from Glastonbury today, and it's been a honor and a pleasure to have uh, Liz on the show today. Right. I hope that you are able to find some of Liz's books and enjoy most of them. Please don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, which can be found when, wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget our partner and spiritual advisor, Rising Phoenix, has videos on YouTube. And also uh, be sure to check out our own YouTube channel for Iowa Pagan News and also Prairie Land Radio Network. As always, if you do have questions later on, you can email us directly at iowapaganews at gmail. You can email me directly at earl at iapnradio.net. Pleasant journeys, everyone. And we will be back again with you next weekend uh, with another special guest. Plus, uh, We've got some exciting stuff coming up for next month. We have two live on-spot series that we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to be appearing uh, at the Des Moines New Age shop May 1st uh, for their, uh, they have another psychic fair at the shop coming up May 1st, which uh, I've also got listed on the Facebook page. I'm also going to be putting on the website. Uh, also, the following weekend, May 8th, we will be over in Ames, Iowa at In Spirit Metaphysical Shop. So stay tuned for details on that. Be sure to swing by if you're in the area. Pleasant journeys, everyone. Have a great day. And thank you, Liz, for joining us. Appreciate it a lot. And uh, keep in touch. Thank you very much. We are out of here. Okay, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> So I'm going to leave the studio. Thank you very much for having me on, and I shall see you on Facebook. All right. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate it. So pleasure. Thank you very much, Earl. Take care. Have a good day. You too.